coming here. Uh, thank you, oh, oh, Professor Ian Reed, for being here with us today to give us a very nice, hopefully, uh, very informative presentation on SLAM and geometry in the area in the era of deep learning. Professor Reed is a professor of computer science at the University of Adelaide and uh, where he was head of the computer of the school of computer science for, uh, from 2018 till 2022 he's fellow of the australian academy of technology sciences and engineering of the australian academy of science former Rhodes scholar and he held the australian laureate fellowship from 2013 till 2018 he has been, or he was a deputy director of the Australian Center for Robotic Vision. So we can see it, roboticvision.org, uh, till uh, last year and uh, worked on computer vision for more than 30 years with research interest ranging across the uh, broad uh, field of the computer vision where he, and he completed his PhD in Oxford in 1992. He was appointed as a lecturer professor in Australia, uh, in Australia, in twenty, in uh, sorry, in Oxford from twenty uh, two thousand till two thousand twelve, and in two thousand twelve he returned to his native land, Australia, where he enjoyed watching birds, <laughs> and, uh, at the University of Adelaide. He has made landmark contribution in areas such as active vision, visual slam, visual geometry, human motion capture, and intelligent visual surveillance. He is currently focusing on lifelong visual learning. He has published extensively and widely with high impact uh, research, uh, and uh, his citation counts uh, uh, close to 50,000 and uh, with an index of 97. He, has, he was recently awarded the Australian Computer Society Artificial Intelligence Distinguished Researcher in 2022 in recognition for his lifelong learning contribution uh, to computer vision and machine learning uh, research. So thank you for joining us today and we will be very happy to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abed. Um, thank you very much uh, everyone for coming here um, and, and everyone online. Um, and I hope I can give you a sense of the, the journey that I've been on in research over the last, um, I would say, decade, and, and how that has changed over the last decade in the era of, of deep learning. So for those who don't know, but, but I hope everyone does know that SLAM is an acronym that stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And it's the idea that you, a, a camera or, or, or a sensor in general, so visual SLAM if it's a camera, can move through an environment and using the geometry of the 3D to 2D projection and the, the sequence of images, you can work out uh, a map of the environment. So. Uh, where point lo points are located in 3D and where the camera is relative to that map you're building. And, and I'm, I'm interested to talk about the, the journey that, that I and my, my colleagues, so I've got a, a, a lot, of, uh, lot of collaborators here, postdocs, students, um, and, and fellow um, uh, investigators, fellow lecturers, uh, people like Gustavo Canero, Tatra Chin, Nico Sunderhoff, and Hamid Razatafigi have been collaborators for, uh, for many years. And then I've worked with a series of, of excellent students and postdocs, um, some of whom I'm, I'm still working with. And this work was funded, uh, I should do my, my standard acknowledgement, funded by the Australian Research Council through, um, uh, as you heard in my bio, uh, a Laureate Fellowship, which is a uh, fellowship from the Australian Research Council, Australian Government, and also the Centre of Excellence in Robotic Vision, which was a, a seven-year um, multi-institution research program of which I was Deputy Director in association with Queensland University of Technology, uh, Australian National University, Monash University and University of Adelaide where I'm based. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how we can go beyond pure geometric SLAM and SLAM solutions over a number of years uh, got better and better and to the point that they were deeply impressive, but were rooted in geometry. They're saying nothing about what was present in the scene. Um, there's just a point cloud and, and where the camera happens to be relative to that point cloud and rarely have they adequately leveraged prior knowledge. And what we've learned over the last, I would say 15 to 20 years in computer vision is that often the most effective priors that we want to use to, um, 
uh, to be able to leverage prior knowledge are ones that we learn from, from data. Um, and, and, and hence the important importance of, of training data. I also want to think about the question of what do we want from ideal slab? Is it just about localizing a camera or do we have the possibility of going beyond slam to turn the camera into a spatial AI sensor. And I I'm not going to lay claim to the, uh, the, the term spatial AI. That, that was one that I first heard my, uh, my close colleague Andy Davison referring to. But, but it's basically the, the idea that we can turn the camera into a real-time situation awareness device that's telling us not just about geometry, but about what's in the scene, what's going on, and can we anticipate what's going on, and so forth. So ideally what we have is something that can do real-time scene understanding, can produce dense, accurate, large-scale and long-lived maps of the environment that are populated in a semantically rich way with objects, not just point clouds, but perhaps even enforce inter-object constraints and so forth. And, and ultimately, from, from my perspective, this is one of the applications of, of such, a, such a device, if we could create it, is that we can go beyond uh, localising a camera to doing real robotic tasks like navigation and robotic interaction um, just through using the, uh, the camera as the sensor for, for this robot. And there are obviously lots of other applications of um, spatial AI, real-time slam and so forth. The one that particularly gets me out of bed is this one that associates it with robotic interaction. So I'm interested mostly in applications uh, that run in real time because that way we, we can do real-time robotic interaction. So it's natural to ask the question, and a few of us have been asking this question for around about seven or eight years, ever since deep learning has, well, seven or eight, well, I suppose 2012 was the, the first time it really came into the, the computer vision consciousness with, the, uh, with AlexNet. Um, what does it bring to the table? So it brings to the table a bunch of things that now we take for granted as being just turnkey solutions. We download our favourite object detector and we can do object detection and recognition out of the box. We can do things like um, semantic segmentation. Uh, we can so we can add a, a, a label to uh, every. Uh, so if I if I go down here, second. Oh, no. um, I'm just going to point. I hope, I hope you can see up here that I'm I'm pointing to something. This this, um, this thing doesn't seem to work terribly well. If I is it if I move away? Oh. A high-tech solution is not nearly as good as the, the, the low-tech solution. Down here, you see, you see, you see an image where uh, every pixel has been labelled with a particular class. Um, uh, we can do depth from a single view, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, we can do things like better matching. Matching is a fundamental problem in multi-view geometry and, and a number of other computer vision tasks. And, and deep learning produces out-of-the-box better features for, for matching. I guess more importantly and more interestingly, it can do things like capture prior information from training data. So perhaps we can squeeze information from large image sets that help us with our reconstruction. Um, and in particular, one of the, the very interesting things that is happening uh, at the moment, and, and I'll show you some preliminary results and, and other people around the world are working on this as well, is learnable geometric representations. So using uh, ideas from G deep learning to, to learn 3D representations uh, rather than rely on point clouds or meshes and so forth. Another really interesting thing, and I won't talk about this at all, but I do want to point to some work from um, uh, uh, Ronnie Clark, for instance, uh, formerly at Imperial, now, uh, now back at Oxford, who's been working on the idea of deep learning for optimization. Um, and, and you may have heard of the, the algorithm RAF that's come out of Princeton, recurrent all pairs, uh, feature transform. Uh, both of these ideas are, are based around the fact that well, the fact that the, the idea that we already know how to do a bunch of stuff in computer vision uh, and uh, computer vision is often formulated as an optimization problem. And one of the problems are, that I see with um, a modern uh, deep learning approach to computer vision is a tendency, particularly of, of new students, to pick up latest deep learning algorithm and just say, okay, well, maybe I can do that thing that people used to do in the 1990s in this way, and I can do it with a feed-forward neural network. And, and I, sometimes that, that works really well. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't work really well. And unfortunately, a, a lot of students spend an awful lot of time trying to make it work better when I don't think it's the right approach in, in many circumstances. And, and I think these... Uh, these ideas do have a lot of promise, 
because what they're saying is we already know how to formulate computer vision problems as, as an optimization. Let's use learning to do better optimization. So rather than learn the solution, let's learn how to update our solution so that instead of relying on just a gradient that tells us the direction to go or a gradient in a Hessian that tells us we're going to approximate our function surface by, um, by, a, by a quadratic, um, let's use a data-driven step size. So, so we're still optimizing the same function, we're still optimizing the same objective, but we're using deep learning to move us there in a more intelligent way so that, uh, that we can converge faster. I'm not going to talk about that, but I, I, th I thought that's a, uh, that's a plug for, I guess, the, the philosophy that I think we should be moving towards in deep learning when we already know how to do stuff like geometry. So in this talk, um, and I've already used up, what, 10 minutes of my allotted 45, so I'll probably go very fast. I might skip over a whole bunch of things, but I wanted to cover these, these four things hopefully not in too superficial detail, but very happy to take questions afterwards. But so I want to talk about just some older work where we're um, very early work where we're trying to use deep networks to do better dense slam. Then I want to talk about how we can turn the camera into a depth sensor using learning and in particular how we can do that uh, using unsupervised learning. I want to talk a bit about object based slam so that we move away from this notion of just a, a point cloud and a camera in a point cloud. And then I'm going to uh, touch on this idea of learned, representative, uh, learned representations of geometry at, at the end and show you some work that's, that's happening already. But before deep learning, this is the kind of stuff that, uh, that I, I was working on. So this is some work from um, the late 2000s or uh, started in the early 2000s with um, Andy Davison, who's a professor at Imperial College. Uh, he was then my postdoc. Uh, when we started this work in Oxford. <coughs> so, so what you're seeing here is the, the, the first real-time structure from motion slam system. Um, and uh, it's detect automatically... Did I touch that? I think I touched that. <laughs> <laughs> I like building technology, I don't like <laughs> using technology. Okay. So if I do that. So it wants the mouse to be there. Sorry, I'll put that down so that nothing bad happens. Detecting features automatically, it's um, working out their depth by triangulation and putting them into a map. It's doing, uh, you'll see in a second, it's doing this active feature search because at the time this was running on very, very li limited hardware. Um, and so these circles are, are actually uncertainty ellipses that are saying we believe that the feature is there. This is happening happening as part of a Kalman filtering approach. So we make a prediction of where we think the feature should be to narrow down a search and, uh, and then do the matching within that search window. And so you can see here, this is the kind of map that uh, 15 years ago, we were able to build in real time on fairly limited hardware, a, a feature map of around about 30 points. And, um, and you can see that these points are uh, represented by uh, positions and uncertainty ellipses, along with a little patch that says what the, what the feature looks like. And I think I'm going to skip over the rest of that. So, so we then started to think about going beyond that to some, uh, some limited learning. And so this is some work from uh, 2011 uh, with one of my students, um, Alex Flint, where uh, we said, okay, well, if we can localize the camera, perhaps we can start to do some inference about the stuff in the world. And so, uh, okay, can we pause for a second? It's okay, if you can carry on, we're just checking something with the wiring. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll keep talking. So, so what you see here is some, um, we're using some learning, single view learning, that, that people at the time were uh, very keen on 
to augment the, the, the scene that we've extracted. So no longer is this a point cloud, this is something that's telling us where the floor and the, the walls of the room are. And down on the bottom right, you see that we were able to do things like uh, dense reconstruction and add in object recognition in, in this particular case in around about 2013. So now I want to talk about how we can improve dense slam with some, some learning. And I guess in the interest of time, I'm going to gloss over a, a lot of the mathematical details, but, but this is a, a fairly standard formulation of, of dense slab. We have a, a photometric cost. And so rather than matching individual features that are being extracted from each image, what we're doing is matching a photometric cost that says uh, for every pixel, we want to optimize the, uh, the depth at that pixel. Um, and, and we're going to do so by matching pixel colors effectively. So, uh, so that's what you're seeing here. Um, uh, so this is, this is um, the intensity at a particular pixel. And this is uh, the difference between what we predict the intensity should be, sorry, what the pixel intensity actually is. And this is what we predict it should be by back projecting from a keyframe or from multiple keyframes and uh, and then reprojecting via the um, the depth that we believe the point to be at and the current pose of the camera. Uh, that photometric cost that is basically just looking at is the brightness of this pixel or the color of this pixel the same over time if we've got the, the depth right. It's no good in regions of uniform brightness. Um, and so what people did previously, so Richard Newcomb working with Andy Davison produced the first dense slam system. And he, he had to have a, a smoothness term in there to say, well, if the photometric cost tells me nothing, then the best I can do is just say, it's probably smooth. And, and that's okay, but it leads to... Yeah, I just shared your screen. Okay. So if I press that, am I still, is this still wrong? So what you're seeing here um, is the idea that instead of using global smoothness, which is a, uh, a, a pretty generic and not very helpful. Uh, How are we doing now? Yeah, okay, sure. okay, go on. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so so I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Hopefully, you guys can, can hear me and. and oh, what's okay. happened? Hopefully, you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about extracting depth from a single image in a bit, but what you see here is a, um, we've trained a deep learning network to learn the, the surface normal. And we believe that the surface normal is a much better prior. Um, so we're gonna use this as a prior for our, our reconstruction rather than using generic smoothness. And so we introduce an additional term to, to the energy. So this energy is dependent on the correct depth of the point. Um, furthermore, uh, rather than just using the intensity of a pixel, it turns out, and this is true in many applications, including optic flow and so forth, that rather than using intensity, if you use a deep feature extracted from that uh, particular pixel and its surroundings, you end up with something that is much more unique to a particular location. And so uh, we can do much better matching using a deep feature 
represented on a per pixel basis. So we now have an energy term that's dependent on features, not just on intensities. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the, the detail of training and testing, and some of this we can do online, and I won't go through the detail of the, the energy minimization. But essentially we have a system now that you feed in, um, you can feed in a segmentation map, or you can compute a segmentation map, you can compute a normal map, you can compute the feature maps of um, a, a, a sequence of images, and they can be fed in to do online camera pose estimation in a, as in the standard SLAM, and we can re-render those um, to do refinement, map fusion, and so forth. And hopefully, on the next slide, you'll see some of the results. I'll show you a video of this in a second. But I just want to compare if we're using, for instance, uh, RGB features. So this is just pure pixel intensity or, or color, um, and just a... Um, just an ordinary smoothness. So this is the, the, the TVL1 smoothness that Richard Newcomb used. Uh, and we're trying to reconstruct this scene here. You get something that's fairly noisy, you get something that's better. If you have the learned prior that says, I want to regularize according to the surface normal that I automatically extract using a deep network. Um, and if you use the learned features and the learned prior, you get something that's um, much cleaner. And that doesn't look as clean as it will in the video. <coughs> to this video. Hopefully that is playing. Maybe not. Okay, it is playing now. So original image up here, so this all runs in real time. Um, automatically selected keyframe down here being displayed as they're chosen. What you're seeing here is a real-time extracted surface normal map that's being passed feed forward through a um, fairly standard um, AlexNet ResNet 18 style network. Um, and this, along with the, the RGB image and the features that are extracted, the deep features that are automatically extracted, go into the energy minimization, which is then producing this map out here. But I guess the key things to note really about this dense map are that A, it's dense, and B, things like the, the desk here, which is uniform brightness, would normally be reconstructed perhaps with, with curves and waves and so forth, because a smoothness prior doesn't give you the, uh, the extra constraint that says this is a flat surface. Whereas if you've learned that uniform regions tend to be flat via the surface normal, then you can impose that at, uh, at test time, at, uh, at run time. So in particular, uh, you see here a comparison with smoothness and you see, uh, which is which, so this is smoothness. This is um, using the, the surface normal. You can't see that terribly well, can you? That's an awful image. <laughs> but um, what I want you to see is that this is all a bit wavy where it should be flat. And this is much flatter, but you can't really see that because it's a terrible image, sorry. But I'm going to move on in the interest of time. So I want to talk about how you can turn a camera into a 3D sensor. And in particular, uh, people have been thinking about this for, for some time. There's some very early work that Alyosha Efros did, taking a single photograph and turning it into, into a pop-up. Uh, later, um, Ashutosh Saxena and, um, and colleagues uh, did some work called Make 3D, where they were using learned features to create a 3D map from a single image. And I, was, I guess I was thinking about this um, and I was very skeptical when, when I first saw the, the Saxena work. I thought, how, how can you do this? But actually, if you start to think about it, well, humans can do it. We, we do it incredibly well. We, we can look at a 2D image and instantly infer 3D, um, particularly we're good at the relationship. Is something further away or closer? And we're using a bunch of cues, cues like scale, cues like vanishing points and, and vanishing lines and so forth. We're doing that all subliminally, but, but we are incredibly good at it. Um, and so I guess it was only a matter of time before um, someone decided to do that in the deep learning era. It happened to be um, a couple of students that I was working with and my, my colleague Chun Wah Shen, and we came up with this um, system for learning uh, depth. And it was a pretty clunky neural net system that had a, a conditional random field sitting on top and so forth. But we started to think about, could we do this um, better? And one of the problems with trying to turn a camera into a 3D sensor from, from a single view is the need for training data. Um, 
And in particular, the, the training data or the, the stuff that you saw from Chun Mai Shen and our, our students was um, a Connect and a camera. Uh, if you want to do that out in the street, then you go out and you collect loads and loads of LiDAR data and corresponding images. And then you've got a ground truth. And you can train your network using ground truth. But, uh, but that's a, a costly process. And um, because you, you need something that's kitted out with synchronized cameras and LiDAR and so forth. So um, my, my um, then uh, postdoc Ravi Garg had this really beautiful idea that's now being imitated much. Um, but he had the idea first back in 2015 and we published it in, in 2016. And the idea is this, suppose we have a pair of views and we happen to know the geometric relationship between those two views. In the first instance, that could be stereo, but it might be that we're also solving the structure from motion problem. If we then had something, an, an oracle um, or a, a CNN in our case, that could generate the depth, we can generate a training signal with using the photometric warp error between two views. So we can take a real view and an estimated depth for that real view and a known transformation to generate a synthetic view that should align with another real view. And that gives us a, a training signal and that training signal can be used to train a deep network. So that's exactly what we did. We have um, up here, a left image, we have a CNN, we predict um, a depth, in fact, we predicted an inverse depth, so a disparity, and from that, we can take a real right image in a stereo pair, warp it back towards what it should look like as viewed from the left, if the depth were right, and we can look at the difference between the warped image and the actual left image, and if there's a difference, that generates a signal that we can then back propagate through our network to, to train that network. So this is the, the reconstruction error. That becomes the photometric loss for our deep network. So obligatory picture of a clunky neural net. We were using a, a very simple uh, Alex net type architecture. I had a conversation with, with Rich Bowden, uh, who's at University of Surrey about uh, four or five months ago. He's just completed a survey of all of this self-supervised single view depth work. And he said, actually, um, your method works as well as any of the ones that have been published subsequently, if you use an up-to-date architecture. So this is using a really clunky architecture, um, and there's lots of work being published subsequently say we can do so much better. It turns out mostly down to the architecture. So this is the early results that, uh, that Ravi was able to generate. And again, let's see if I can do that. So this is from, from 2016. Um, so this is the input to, to the neural network, and what you see down the bottom is the depth that's being predicted in a single feed forward pass through the network um, where lighter is closer to you, darker is further away. <coughs> um, and so I, I, I thought it was really quite remarkable that we were able to learn, for instance, as you see the pedestrians walking across here, you can actually see them uh, being extracted in the depth map as well. So then we've moved um, one step beyond that to say, well, if we're doing a slam and we know the relative pose between camera one and camera two, because we're, we're doing slam, we can do the same thing. Instead of being a stereo pair, this can now be a single camera moving through the environment. Uh, and we can compute uh, depth. We could even compute visual odometry just using a feed forward network. Turns out to be a really bad idea, but that's what we did in this particular example. And again, I'm not gonna, go through the bore you with the detail of this block diagram. But the basic idea is the same, except that now we've got a single camera moving through the environment. And the photometric loss comes from the combination of the, the error that we have in estimating the relative pose and the error that we have in estimating the depth. But it turns out that there's still a strong enough signal that we can regularize both of those. And then there are further things that we can do. We can look at um, not just if we're looking at a sequence, we can look not just at the photometric loss, but we can also look at the depth loss. We expect that images, uh, depth maps that are predicted at time t should be basically the same as or completely alignable with image, uh, depth maps that we create at time t plus one. And, and if we do that, then we can regularize issues such as scale drift and so forth. Um, and so that's some, some work that my, my student Joang Bian did. Um, so this depth loss enables geometric consistency to prevent scale changes between, uh, between images. Um, it also automatically enables us to flag 
moving regions because the moving regions are inconsistent with the geometry that's predicted in the um, in the two views so we can mask them out um, and uh, that can help uh, mitigate drift of the, the network as, as we're learning so it creates these self-discovered masks of, of places that are good to learn again look, there's, there's some bold numbers go and read the paper if you want to see bold numbers <laughs> but they're, they're all a bit small in these slides um, nicer to see a video, but even this video isn't particularly interesting. This is really just saying, okay, well, we're generating some, um, some depth maps from a single view. And if we align those depth maps, then we can create a, a fly through of the environment that we're moving through. Um, there are still some issues with, with that. Um, and subsequently, people have come up with supervised methods for estimating depth from a single camera that are significantly better in a qualitative sense. We're not very good at finding the depth boundaries between uh, objects, particularly where there are moving objects in the scene. Uh, we're not very good at enforcing smoothness across objects. Um, and, and the supervised methods, particularly this method that, uh, that my colleague Chun Wai Shen and his students came up with for doing what, what, uh, what we're calling pseudo depth, was very good at qualitative depth. It was very good at getting the, the ordering correct. So you can see here things, same, same kind of false coloring, things that are closer, in this case, are darker, things that are lighter are further away. The actual accuracy of this as a depth map is pretty poor, but actually it's very good at getting the depth ordering right. Closer things are, uh, are darker than the things that are, that are further away again. It's also very good at smoothness, sharp and accurate depth boundaries, but as I said, poor quantitative depth. So, um, so Joang had the idea that we would use that as an additional loss to regularize a self-supervised system. So, so you learn your, uh, your pseudo depth, and you can learn that from a massive data set, and it just sits there as an oracle saying, uh, yes, you got the depth ordering right, or no, you got the depth ordering wrong. And you build that into a, a loss function, or two additional loss functions here, the uh, dynamic region uh, thing, which encourages a consistent depth ordering, um, and this, uh, this local smoothness that encourages local smoothness by looking at the, the relative surface normals that are predicted both by the, the pseudo depth and by the, uh, by the network that Jowen is trying, uh, trying to create. And you can learn in an end-to-end -end fashion, well, so this is an oracle, but, um, think of it as, as being a teacher that says, yeah, you got the depth ordering right, you got the depth ordering wrong. And these are the two networks that we're trying to learn, the depth net and the pose net. And it turns out that that um, gives you no degradation in your ability to estimate uh, quantitative depth in static scenes, but does a whole lot better on dynamic scenes. So here are some examples that, uh, that Jowing has produced. And again, this is, this is false coloring. Dark red in this instance means very close. And, uh, and dark blue means very far away. So this is now approaching the kind of accuracy that you can get from um, very, very uh, strongly supervised networks with massive, massive data sets, but has the ability to continue to learn um, over time. And again, in the interest of time, I'll skip over. So one of the questions I posed at the start, or I, I didn't pose as a question, I just said, I, I'm not sure we're using deep learning in the right way in some of these uh, 3D vision problems. And one of the things we wanted to, to think about was, is, is learning visual odometry, as we were in that previous example, and, and a number of other people tried to do the right thing to do. And I, I'm pretty convinced it's not the right thing to do. Um, and in fact, there's there's some, some work from Torsten Sattler where they looked at, uh, estimating camera pose using a convolutional neural network and said actually it's, it's a bit it doesn't work very well um, and and likewise for visual odometry it turns out that it, it doesn't generalize very well it doesn't work that well we've not been able to do better with uh, with a deep learning approach directly applied directly to visual odometry than we have with just using standard geometry but we do know that, uh, that deep learning works very well for matching problems and for optic flow problems. <coughs> and so the, the dumb idea that, uh, that my, my student, Huang Ying Zhan, engineered into a really beautiful system was that we use the deep flow for matches and we use standard epipolar geometry for estimating the relative motion between frames. Um, or in some cases, if, the, if there's no motion, 
then, uh, then epipolar geometry doesn't work. But if you've got a single view depth estimate, then you can do a perspective endpoint to, to align your current pose to, to the depth estimate. Um, and that turns out to work pretty well. And another benefit of having that, um, that single view depth estimate is that it sets the scale, so, uh, which is a real problem for epipolar geometry typically. So it turns out that this is not actually a bad idea um, if we do some sensible engineering uh, that's boosted by a bit of learning rather than replacing the engineering with learning altogether. So this is a very busy slide, apologies, but the basic idea is that if we've got images at time t and time t plus one, so this is monocular visual odometry, we're trying to work out the relative motion of a camera as it goes through the environment, we're not so cared about the map. So we have these images at time t and t minus one, we predict the depth map, we also predict a forward flow and a backward optic flow, and we look where they're consistent. Uh, one of the problems with, with using optic flow or any kind of matching is that you might match into regions that are occluded or unoccluded, and that, that causes outliers. So, so this very simple check of consistency between forward and backward, and you can see that check here, blue areas it's consistent, red areas it's inconsistent because there are things that are being exposed in the scene as we move through it that actually don't have a physical match. Um, in, in, the, in the corresponding image. And so we shouldn't be trying to, to match that. So what, uh, what Huang Ying did was to, to look, just to take the top end of these flows. So here are the ones that have been filtered via that top end criterion, take the very best ones, and then just use standard geometry. And having done that, we end up with a system that actually works remarkably well. And again, rather than bore you with um, the, the details of bold numbers and, and the like, let me just show a video that's working. Try to show a video that's working. <laughs> Might even try and skip forward a bit because you've seen this already. I'll give you a different, different video. Cut straight to the chase. So this is actually a, a slightly newer version where we're doing stereo visual odometry. So there are matches not only temporally from team, time t minus one to time t, but also between left and right camera. Um, and the matches now are being done using uh, the, the raft um, uh, matching criterion, which is the uh, beautiful algorithm out of Princeton. Um, so what you see here, this is the disparity that's been estimated using the, the rough stereo. Uh, we're also doing those temporal matches, as I said. And what you can see here is the trajectory that's been estimated. So these are features that have been matched from um, time t minus one to time t that are being used to estimate that relative motion of the camera pair. And I think at some point, hopefully this video is going to speed up and you'll see the rest of the trajectory overlaid on a, on a satellite view. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you want to see the video later, Oh, and then obligatory version on uh, running on, on Kitty, which is the, the standard data set that, that everyone uses. Um, I'd rather show you the, the one taken from Roseworthy because it shows it's actually working in the field um, uh, rather than just offline. Uh, but, so I'll skip that over. That says four, I think it's supposed to say three object based slam. Um, and I think what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I'm going to skip over these. This is really just the idea that. Um, if we can do object detection out of the box, so if we can do slam out of the box and we can do object detection out of the box, we can also, it turns out, and I'm not going to talk about how we do this, we can do shape uh, reconstruction out of the box. So this is the reconstructed shape of a car that has been detected on the side of the road. We can insert those models into our geometric um, geometric map of the environment. And so we're starting to build towards 
uh, a map that is no longer just a set of uh, points, but is actually populated with objects and regions and so forth. So, so this particular version, this video doesn't show it detecting planes as well, but the, the student who created this has um, the ability to represent generic objects as ellipsoids, planes as planes, enforce constraints between planes and objects, enforce constraints between planes and planes, and also use points serendipitously <laughs> in the environment to, to localize. Um, and I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides as well, because before I finish, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've been doing. And this, this is, uh, in some respects, uh, hot off the press. Some of it's not even published. But I, I just want to throw it out there as um, things for people to think about. We're very excited about this idea. Uh, well, the whole community is very excited about this idea of NERF. Uh, if you work in computer vision and you haven't heard of NERF, then you've probably been living under a rock, despite the fact it was published only two years ago. Um, but prior to, to, to NERF was something called Deep SDF, and there are a couple of other papers published around about the same time as Deep SDF. So this came from Richard Newcomb and his group at, at Facebook Reality Labs. Um, this came from, from Ben Mildenhall. The basic idea that's, that's at the heart of both of these is pretty much the same one and it's potentially very very powerful and that's why people are excited about it it's the idea that you can take a voxel grid representation so a standard representation of 3d space is that you have a voxel grid and you just say is this point occupied or is it not and that's your representation of space you can extend that still on the voxel grid to something like a sign distance representation where the value at any voxel comprises the distance to the nearest surface and that TSDF, the truncated sign distance function representation, turns out to be incredibly powerful and is at the back end of um, Connect Fusion and various other cool algorithms for reconstructing using RGBD data. But the idea of uh, behind DeepSDF and behind uh, NERF and, and all these other things is that you can replace this voxel grid with, um, which is essentially just a lookup table of your, your chosen representation. With, uh, with a multi-layer perceptron. So that's what, that's what this is. You pass in a coordinate X, Y, Z. So over here, you pass in an X, Y, Z coordinate and you get a value because you've got this massive lookup table. Here, you pass in your X, Y, Z to, a, um, to an MLP. You learn that MLP and, and it produces a, a value V that says what is in the cap case of deep SDF. It tells you what is the distance to the nearest surface. Um, uh, in, in just it could just be a binary value occupied or not occupied or and this was the the, the, the beautiful insight in NERF it could be something much richer it could be things like uh, the density of the surface and the, the the color value or the radiance and so forth so so you can then start to use it for novel view synthesis which is which is what NERF was doing but it's a nice representation for a whole bunch of reasons one is you can get some potentially massive compression uh, there's a lot of redundant information in the voxel grid that if you choose the size of your representation um, judiciously, then you can get quite a lot of compression, sometimes at the cost of speed, of course. Um, it's a continuous representation, so no longer do you explicitly have to do uh, interpolation, depending on the size of your grid, but, uh, but you actually get high quality interpolation pretty much for free. It fills in the gaps for you. These values that you're passing in here don't have to be values that you trained on. They can be um, values that are intermediate between things that have been trained on. And I think the thing that's most exciting for me, and I don't really know how to do this, so people are starting to get to this, but I think it's, it's a very exciting area, is that it can capture prior information. This is something that has sort of got lost in the rush to replicate NERF itself. But if you go back to the deep SDF paper, what they were doing was saying, well, I can actually condition my lookup on some information that I've already got. And so if I see half of this chair, I can reconstruct the other half of that chair. So it was a class based learning that they had in the, in the weights of the network, not an instance specific learning. And most of NERF work is instance specific. The great thing about deep SDF was it was class specific. Um, how, how you can leverage that, I think is, is an open question, but, but we're starting to, to think about some of those things. One of the things that people around the world have thought about is, can you use NERF 
uh, style or deep SDF representations in a SIAM system. And so the first people to do this were um, Andy Davidson's group. They created a system called IMAP, um, which, which was great. Uh, I don't want to take away from, from that. They, they were the first to do it. There were some limitations to that system. Uh, there was some real cleverness to the system, but one of the problems with it was that it, it only worked with a depth camera. And, and in fact, they were using the depth in slightly cheaty kind of ways, but also not using the depth in ways that would have improved performance quite considerably. So, um, and in particular, they were trying to localize the camera with respect to the NERF representation that they had built. So you're trying to build this NERF representation incrementally, and they were trying to localize the camera with respect to that, despite the fact that actually what they've got for free from the Connect is not only two images, but two, depth, two dense depth maps that you could, you could just use iterated closest point or standard epipolar geometry to work out how the camera has moved. Um, and actually that turns out to be a whole lot better. So, so th this is one of the things that uh, one, of my, uh, one of my current students did as the, the first thing in his PhD was to say, okay, well, let's create an implementation of IMAP, but um, we're not going to localize the camera with respect to, to the map. We're just gonna work out what its relative motion is using standard epipolar geometry and standard iterated closest point. And it turns out that uh, that works faster and better than, than IMAP. So, so we're not trying to use deep learning for stuff that it's not actually very good for, but we are still using that, um, that MLP representation of the environment, which turns out to be great. And you can see that these flat surfaces here really do come out as flat. Um, and that's, um, that we, we pretty much get that for free from the, uh, from the NERF representation. And I think this video goes on a bit, so I won't subject you to, to the full amount, but you can see that this, this, this particular system that, that Greg made, um, you probably can't see it, but there are cameras being localized, keyframe is being dropped along the way, and it's doing a really good job of reconstructing that scene in a dense manner with quite high fidelity. The other thing that we played around with is the idea that you can use a, a learned representation for a semantic map. So uh, we can take a satellite view of something and we can convert it to class labels. So in this case, it's being converted to building, vegetation, road, and, and other stuff. But, but what you're seeing here is not a, um, just a grid of pixel values. What you're seeing here is a reconstruction from uh, an MLP. So this is a, uh, a neural representation of the classes so we can query any point in this MLP and say, what class does this have? Um, and that's been reconstructed. So in fact, what we reconstruct is a series of one hot vectors. And you can see those here. Um, and, and I won't go into the detail of that. But what we've used that for is for doing localization of a, of a robot. So up here, we have a, um, the, the neural map is, is our representation. And we can predict what we believe the, the scene should look like at what we believe the current location should be. That goes through the network. And so that generates what we predict the scene should look like. Down here, we have a real observation. And this observation has been taken with a LIDAR that has then been segmented into those, uh, those classes. So this was acquired by a satellite. This is acquired by a ground level LIDAR telling us uh, what's in our immediate surrounds. And um, we can look at the difference between this and this, and back propagate that as if it were a loss in a, in a network. We're not going to change the weights of the network, but we are going to back propagate that to find out where our next location should be. Basically using the, the network to do gradient descent to find where this is uh, relative to, to the, the overall map. So if I start that video, you'll see that running. In fact, I think, is it running already? You'll be pleased to know I'm nearly done. Okay, so this is the overall map of the scene. There's a distribution of particles here. We're using a particle filter to represent where we might be. So this is a distribution over where we think we are. And this is the output of the LIDAR. So we have a semantic segmentation of the LIDAR. And we're trying to find the location in the map here that is the best fit for that LIDAR. 
And so you can see the box here, that's it moving along, uh, localizing the LIDAR to the overhead view of the scene. And what we've been able to show is that that converges with a much wider basement of convergence and much faster if we're using the semantic neural map than if we're just using a, a standard um, pixelized grid and doing a, a brute force or, or gradient based search. And I'm going to skip over the last bit because it's not, well, actually, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to show you this video. So we've also thought about how can we do active reconstruction? A lot of the, the NERF work is based on the idea that you start with a large number of views. But what happens if you have, uh, if you start with only one view and you're trying to build up that? Can you use the fact that uh, you, you've got some uncertainty about what the shape looks like to guide where you should move next? So that's exactly what we've done here. We're doing incremental reconstruction and the motion of the camera is now guided by uh, the entropy that we see in the physical reconstruction. One of the things that about NERF is that it's mostly interested in the quality of re-rendering of an image. As a, someone who dabbles in robotics, I'm more interested in the quality of the reconstruction rather than the quality of the rendered view. And so, um, so you can see here some examples where we've used active reconstruction where physically guiding the camera to move to places that are going to reduce the entropy of the reconstructed scene. Um, so that's what's happening on the, uh, uh, in those views. And then once we've acquired those views, we can throw them at a, something that will do a refinement of, of the shape. And you can see here from a small number of views, we're getting, um, so, so this is happening pretty much in real time. We're acquiring this model. Uh, it looks nasty, but actually once it's refined, it turns out to be very good. So offline, we can then refine and we end up with something that's really quite high fidelity in terms of its, its shape. Okay, so um, various conclusions. Um, first of all, as you've seen, deep networks can capture semantics and they can even <coughs> capture geometry in, in quite interesting and powerful ways. Um, they're very good at extracting information and relationships that, that we find hard to model explicitly or analytically. But to me, that says we should use them in instances where we do find it hard to model these things analytically. If we can model something well analytically, then, then I think that we should. Um, deep networks obviously do certain things very, very well. So they provide better and stronger priors for smoothness, for scene regularization. They provide better features for matching. I've also shown that we can use geometry for supervision so that we can then boost the performance of, of other geometric systems at a later date. They obviously enable richer semantics and sometimes even in reconstruction, which can help us with uh, uh, even in real time, which can help us with reconstruction. Um, and, and I guess part of the message, and I've, maybe I've banged on about this a little bit too much during the talk, but I think that uh, deep network should be a supplement for and a complement to geometry not a replacement for it. I think it's the wrong way to say, we're going to, just going to use feed forward and it's going to produce geometry um, or it's going to produce semantics or anything. We should be thinking about what do we know how to do now and how can we use deep learning to make it work better rather than replace it with deep learning. So what are the future challenges? Well, th there's, there's still lots. Um, in fact, uh, in my talk tomorrow, I'm going to show a... Um, something that I saw when I first walked into Mike Brady's office. Many of you might know uh, Mike as the, um, I think the original president or interim president of, of, of MBZ UAI. Um, and he was my PhD supervisor. I walked into his office in 1988, I think it was. And on his wall was uh, a handwritten note from Olivier Fogeras, who's another one of the founding fathers of, of computer vision. And it said, in five years' time, all computer vision problems will be solved and we will be out of a job. Um, if they have not been, then I undertake to buy Mike a six bottles of very good claret, uh, or he will do the same for me. Um, that was written in 1986. Uh, needless to say, Mike won that bet. I've never asked him what, uh, what claret Olivia actually bought him. But... Um, <laughs> Few vision systems operate for extended periods. So that's something, if they're gonna be part of a robotic system, they need to be able to operate reliably over extended periods. <coughs> they usually don't get better over time. And some of the self-supervised methods that I've been talking about, I hope can be 
the, a step along the way to making these things work better over time. So we still have this challenge of online learning and lifelong learning. Um, in particular, even current systems that are so impressive compared to 30 years ago when I started, they pale in comparison to the average two-year-old. And, th and they don't generalize. We, we, we now know that we can throw a huge amount of data at these things and they can do pretty well. But show them one picture of a horse and one picture of a zebra, they won't be able to distinguish between them, whereas an average two-year-old can probably point to lots of other horses shown as single examples. So their generalization ability is poor. Um, and, for, and for me personally, the, the challenge of, of real robotic vision is how do we couple sensing to action? And, and there's one way of doing that, which is just to say, well, let's just suck in pixels and, and join that to imitation learning or, or reinforcement learning. Um, to me, that has some pretty serious safety implications. It actually works incredibly well. And my, my postdocs and students have repeatedly shown me to be wrong in terms of how well it can work. But I, I struggle to see how we can ever trust a system like that because I don't think we can ever, um, well, be sure about things like corner cases and common sense. And that's because the vision systems still don't really understand their environments and they can't tell us why they went wrong if, if they went wrong. I don't have answers to those, but I think they're really fascinating questions for us to be thinking about in the future. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Ray. Questions? Hi, thank you very much for an interesting talk. So I have a couple of questions. The first one is that in the start, uh, you mentioned uh, substituting the intensity values with the D feature representations. Yeah, yeah. So well, I wonder what was the uh, dimensionality of the feature D features that, that uh, were used there? Yeah, so in that instance, uh, I suspect they were about 32 dimensional. Um, but, but I think the dimensionality of those features, I, I, I don't actually know the, the details of that. But, but in that instance, the dimensionality is less important than, than the receptive field of those features. Because I think what, what makes them work so much better is that they've been computed over quite a large receptive field. And that means that um, a point here on the wall looks quite different from a point here on the wall in terms of its feature representation. So I, I don't know, I'd have to talk to, um, to Siraj who, who did the work, but I suspect that a relatively small dimensionality would be enough to capture the differences between that point and that point, providing the receptive field is, is wide enough. Uh, I mean, the reason I, I asked this was, uh, I was just wondering whether the, the, the intuition was to use uh, or get more the semantic representations or use um, more low level feature representation that replaces uh, handcrafted intensity or RGB based uh, features just to get a better localization. It's it's the latter, <laughs> most, most definitely. You can of course use those features to to go further to to be able to get semantic representations and so forth. Um, and, and at the moment, a lot of our systems we, we we almost have a separate system for doing this, a separate system for doing that. But but perhaps we could be just learning generic features that are good for, for all of those tasks. Uh, I don't know that anyone's done that. And we were certainly thinking more about the localization ability. One of the things I didn't talk about in that particular work was that we then, uh, we did some self-supervision there. So, so those features that, that were being matched, we would look at how well they were matched. And if they weren't matched well, we'd use that as a backprop signal to try and improve the features themselves uh, once, once we'd localized the camera. Uh, and my second question is, uh, uh, you also mentioned here in the future challenges about uh, uh, this, uh, the applicability of these vision systems working for an extended period of time. So in that uh, regard, for instance, uh, long-term visual localization uh, is kind of a very practical uh, mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. For instance, when there are day and night changes, yes. and yeah. when there are seasonal variations and weather variations, yeah. how we can effectively get uh, six degree of uh, freedom uh, for accurate camera poses. So, so um, recently there have been uh, work uh, uh, by the groups of uh, Joseph Sivich and uh, Freddie Karp. They have introduced a data set called visuallocalization.net. And they showed that a lot of these methods, uh, visual localization methods kind of struggle uh, for this long-term yeah. uh, yeah. uh, localization. So, so I just wonder where, where, what do you think, where the, the community kind of stands at the moment and what do you think could be done uh, for this long-term localization? Yeah, so my, my, my colleague, Mike Milford, who was, uh, was an investigator with me in the um, Center of Excellence for Robotic Vision has made his entire career <laughs> around localization. That, that's pretty much the only problem that, that he thinks about these days. And he's particularly interested in 
uh, those changes in weather and scene and so forth. I'll, I don't have a solution. Um, various things that we have dabbled with have been along the lines of uh, doing domain transfer, that, uh, that maybe what you've got is a huge data set that works during the day. How do you, and, and can you make it generalize to, to the nighttime? And, and perhaps the way to do that is via domain transfer. That domain transfer might be, for instance, using a, um, a GAN or something else to, you, you condition your GAN on the daytime and you try to generate a nighttime version of the same thing. Um, and you could do, uh, and, and we've, we've shown some success doing that. The, the other approach that, that actually, for some applications, works really well, it, it's practical, but, but I think it's, it's very nice. Um, so Paul Newman has this idea of the experience and, and he uses the fact that if you're driving through an environment, you've got a whole bunch of other cues that tell you that you're driving through the same environment. You don't just have to rely on, on, on the visual thing. You've, you've got maybe odometry, you've got relative motion and all of these things. So he says, I know that I am where I was two weeks ago, but it looks different. Maybe because there's a load of cars parked there or maybe it's snowed. Um, but I know that I'm in the same place. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to keep what he calls visual experiences. You just create this big database. And the more you do it, the more experiences you accumulate and, and you get better and better at localizing. And, and I guess that's, that's the equivalent of, so if, if you, I've been around in vision for long enough to know um, historical solutions to, to various things as well. And object pose recognition was one that taxed people in the early days of computer vision. And what we what we all tried to do was to come up with geometric invariants that if we could find those things in the image, they would automatically give us mathematical information about the pose. And so there was stuff from Joe Mundy, there was stuff from Grimson, Lozano Perez and so forth, where if you found these geometric things, the surface normals or the angle, then, then you could get access to the pose. Um, and I think we were, we were worried about that because we didn't have much compute power, we didn't have much memory. But what's turned out to be a much more effective way of getting um, uh, recognizing pose, for instance, is just to look at many, many views of the of the object. And and the, the Newman solution to um, the changing appearance of things is, is very much in, in that. Element. You just say, okay, well, memory is not so much a problem as what it used to be. Um, and searching big things is not so much a problem as what it used to be. Let's just continue to build a big database and search the database. Yeah, that's that's uh, actually pretty interesting. So my last question is regarding the fact that you mentioned that uh, generic feature representations is kind of uh, important uh, in, in this context. Uh, however, there's also, uh, for instance, uh, recent attempts in making general purpose vision systems. For instance, if uh, the community is solving different tracking problems, like single target tracking, multi target tracking, how we can have one single unified architecture that kind of uh, inputs, the input is the same, but the output can be different. It could be multiple targets or single target as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to believe that could be the way to go also in geometry, for instance, having general purpose uh, systems that kind of solve different geometry problems. Um, I haven't thought about uh, that particular problem, but yeah, I, I, I can see that it, it, it could be valuable. I, I worry a little bit maybe that um, are we are we asking too much of a particular system to, to get it to solve all of these problems? Um, do, and do we even need to do that? Um, I think probably, well, um, let, 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 let me give you an analogy, which may, may or may not help about my thinking. Um, and this is in terms of robotic control. And there, there are various people who've thought about, well, how do I do robot control when the, when the environment changes. Um, do I have a switchable control regime? Um, and maybe that's the same as your um, uh, all singing, all dancing network that can solve all of your tracking problems. Uh, probably to get it to do that, at some point you've got to have a switch that says, well, this is the environment that I'm in. Choose this one or choose this one or, or choose this one. And uh, a nicer solution in the robotic control one is one that Jitendra Malik is um, touting at the moment, which is to say, you try to model the physics of the world and you have one policy to, to move your robot, but that policy is informed not just by the, the current state of the robot, but 
by your measurement of the environment as well, the physics of the environment. Um, and, and we're thinking about that in the context of, of sensing, where um, we want to be able to um, do sensor fusion between vision and LIDAR. So it's, it's not the same as um, one network to solve multiple tracking problems, but it's multiple sensors that can inform the same problem. But some of those sensors work better. LIDAR works at night, vision doesn't. Uh, LIDAR is terrible in the rain, vision is perhaps a little bit better in the rain. Um, and, and rather than having one network for the vision and one network for, for LIDAR, uh, we're trying to think about ways that we could have maybe a single system that is able to attend, and so you can probably sense where I'm going if I say attend to the, the relevant sensor as it's needed. So we're thinking about transformer architectures that can uh, informed by um, some abstract, some abstraction of, of the current image and LiDAR data that we're getting can, can make some guess at the physics of what's going on and therefore can inform the, the best sensors and the best bits of those sensors to attend to. So that's, that's a slightly long-winded and yeah. not, not very direct answer to your question, but the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other question? Oh, thanks. Thank you. We, we took lots of your time. Thank you very much. And uh, we thank you.